Hi, this is Doug with Elder Jim, and I'm proud to introduce Dick Curtis here, legendary comedic actor, and we're going to talk about his past and his exercise routine through his life and now. Chicago, we were an itinerant family in those days. We used to move a lot. And there were two theaters in Chicago, the Chicago Theater and the Oriental, and there were two of the biggest vaudeville houses in the world. And they had just added screens to show movies. And my mother took me to the Oriental. And I couldn't see over the lady in front of me, so my mother said, sit in the arm. And she said, I, can you see? And I said, oh, yeah. And I saw singers and dancers and a dog act. And the stars of the show were, uh, oh, I'm sorry, they were, uh, Jack Benny and Mary Livingston. Oh my goodness. I'm 88, folks, and oh. it takes a <laughs> My memory is kind of bad. Anyway, Jack Benny and Mary Livingston were doing an act similar to George and Gracie in those days. And they were the stars of the show, and I was thrilled with what I saw. And I remember clearly leaning down to my mother and saying, when I grow up, that's what I'm going to do. And she said, that's nice. And with that encouragement, how could you miss? <laughs> I was a singer. We all sang in our family. So as time went by, we were living in Indianapolis, downtown Indianapolis, because that was the poor section of town in those days, 1936. And I was at the corner selling papers and shiny shoes and running errands and selling papers and magazines. And I used to run errands for all the actors at all the theaters in town, including this one called the Lyric Theater in downtown Indianapolis. And I would, uh, I had that got me in free in the front and the stage door, and I could watch the action, learn how to do it. But besides that, I used to go to the radio station and I'd say, I want to be on the radio. And they'd say, how old are you? I said, I'm eight. And I said, okay, well, you can be a gopher. And if you get an eight-year-old part, you can do it. And that's how I got on radio. I'm now a member of the Indiana Pioneer Broadcast Association. Oh my goodness. Anyway, I used to run errands for all the actors, and one day I was backstage in 1936, and I yelled out, who needs anything? And this guy said, give me a variety and a Coca-Cola kid. I said, okay. And I ran down the street to where my mother worked in the lobby of a hotel, selling papers. And I was taking, she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm running errands for actors. She said, who? I said, well, all of them, but today it's for this tall old guy with red hair. His name is Skelton. He was 23 and he was here at this theater. And I took the papers back and we sat in the dressing room and he told me jokes and stories. And I said, well, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And we were friends from that day until the day he died. And we worked together at uh, CBS, because I was doing the Jonathan Winter show at that time, and he owned the hour at CBS where we had the show. It was CBS way of paying rent or money, because they couldn't afford him after a while, he got so big. And we were friends still the day he died. And uh, so that's, that's how he started. Uh, but I was still, you know, I was just a little kid. And uh, time went by and we kept moving different different towns. My father was selling real estate. And finally, my mother got tired of that, took us back to Indianapolis. But while we were moving, I, every city we would go to, I would go to the radio station or television, not television, radio. And radio was all live in those days. And so I started working in radio there and in Detroit at WJR which was in the tower of the uh, Fisher Building in those days. And the same thing, they hired me to be a gopher, and if you, they had a young man's part, I got it. So I'm now a member of the Pioneer Broadcast Association in Detroit as well. But later I worked uh, the nightclubs in Detroit, the Cass Theater and the uh, 
they got a lot of different nightclubs they had. And then across the river, I used to do work over there as well. So that's how it all started. And almost every little town in America during the 50s had at least one little restaurant where they had a trio to play for dancing, a guy like me to help tell jokes and sing songs. And uh, if you could keep moving, uh, you could at least pay the rent. In towns like East Dubuque, Illinois, and Mishawaka, Indiana, and Kenosha, Wisconsin. <laughs> you remember George Gold? Yeah. Well, George was a good friend of mine, and he and I worked a lot of the same clubs. And uh, at one place, at, in East Dubuque, Illinois, they had a picture of George and a picture of me, and a sign said, the only two. And George one day said to me, what do you think they meant by that? I said, George, I think it means we're the only two who will accept the salary they're paying there. I think that's it. <laughs> he said, I think you're right. So that's how we all started. And I kept doing it uh, right up to uh, 1950. And I was recalled for Korea within the Marine Corps. And then when I got out from that, I went back in and doing the same thing and trying to work my way up. And um, when did you feel the need to start running in oh, your career? Not till about 1971, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I was divorced from my children's mother and I was living by myself. And I was, by then I was a director and producer. And I, I couldn't sleep very well. And uh, so I'd be awake at four o'clock in the morning and I thought, I, I can't do, I gotta do something. So I got up and I walked, I lived near UCLA in those days. And I w walked down to the UCLA track and ran twice around it. And I was, I almost fainted. I thought, boy, I, I'm worn out. That was only two times around the track. And I thought, it felt good though, so I think I'll do that again. That was the beginning. Within uh, about three years of early morning every day, I used to run. Finally, I was running 10 miles a day, everywhere and anywhere, in towns where I was working in nightclubs. And, uh, and then when the New York Marathon came, that's the first one, here, 1976. I was a member of the New York Roadrunners in those days. And uh, that's me right there. See me? <laughs> well, I'm somewhere in there. Somewhere in that crowd. Yeah. And that, there were fewer than 2,000 of us in that one. But I ran about, I don't know, for the next four, five, six years, something like that. This is 1980, and I had started to slow down a little. And uh, I used to run every morning, any weather, snow, rain, and people would say, you're nuts. I said, I know, I know. What was the most difficult area you ran in? Snow in uh, New York and Kansas, I was doing a television show in the daytime in Wichita, Kansas, and I would run every morning in s snow. My, I'd wake up at four o'clock in the morning and say, oh, I'm not gonna run out in that silly, in the snow, I'm not doing it. And while I was saying that to myself, I was putting on my running gear, and I was I'm just not gonna do it. And I opened the door and started running. <laughs> it's compulsive after all. So while. even with your busy schedule, you managed to run every morning. Every morning at 4.30 and I did it all over the world in Rome and Paris and London and wherever they had a run I used to go do it. Oh Not because I was fast, I never broke four hours but uh, I was finished and they say finishers are winners. And this helped kind of reduce the stress of your stressful lifestyle. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. because <laughs> you run that long in the morning uh, there's nothing too important. Settles you down for the rest of the day, doesn't it? Yeah. Right. Did you have any injuries along your way as you were running? I was very lucky. I, I never had any kind of a bad thing happen. And uh, I stopped running because I had an operation on a similar, or it was a very small act, uh, operation that the doctor assured me he could do and he didn't do it well. And I had to take a lot of operations to fix it, and then I couldn't run anymore. But uh, I walk now at the same time. 
Yeah, you know, I was going to get in. What is your routine now? How do you stay active now during the day? I'm up at 4.30 every morning, and I go out and I walk for whatever distance I can. And, uh, and then I come to work here at the Baby Quail Inn. I'm here every morning, uh, 7 o'clock, to set up our breakfast, which we serve to all of our guests. It's complimentary breakfast. And my wife, Misty, and I uh, are the proprietors here. And one of her daughters is our general manager. And uh, I had three daughters. That's interesting, I think. Uh, see, where is she? This one, this one, and this one. This one is now an artist. She's now 62 years old, 64 years old. And when she was about 30, she said to me, Dad, were you in the war? I said, yeah. I was And she said, well, you never told us about that. I said, well, honey, you don't put three little girls in a line and say, let me tell you about a war. And uh, my granddaughter, I think I told her, she said to me one day when she was about five, this is her here, when she was about five, five, she said, Grandpa, you were in a war. I said, yeah. And she said, oh, sure, but where did you sleep? I said, I'm mostly in a hole in the ground, honey. And she said, oh, sure, but what if it rained? I said, oh, well, then we had to stand up. I don't like war, I said, me either. And that was it. <laughs> but the nice thing is, now she's about 20, she's going to college up in Montreal, and her two brothers who are older. We all went to Washington, D.C., so I could show them the memorial there to the Marine Corps. Great, great. Well, thank you for your service, Dick, and I appreciate talking to you. It's, it's my pleasure. Great. And uh, we'll see you next year. Okay. <laughs>